Well, we've said for years that we believed uh, we would experience inflation and deflation at the same time. And up until a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, if you talked about inflation, you know, you'd get browbeaten and people would say, no, we've got low interest rates, low inflation, uh, good growth, et cetera, et cetera. You know, fast forward to where we are now, and we just had the hottest mm -hmm. uh, CPI numbers. And by the way, CPI and PPI are only the effects of the of the inflation. They're not the actual inflation itself. Inflation is the increase in money supply. Uh, in any case, pretty much everyone has seen how drastic the effects of inflation are. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say probably from uh, two years ago, things are up on average anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. And that's pretty much across the board, except for wages. Uh, the, what I believe we're going to see now is now we're, we're, we're very, very close to seeing a deflation, a massive deflation of assets. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason being, if you go back, uh, you go back to the beginning of COVID, the 10 year treasury traded as low as 0.38 of a percent. Yesterday, it traded as high as 2.75%. So there's already been a massive uh, deflation in bonds, in the credit markets. And it's important to understand that in today's world, the foundation to the entire financial system is credit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's happening is the foundation over the last two years, and in particular the last six months, because more than half of the rise in rates has happened over the last four to six months. And what this rise in interest rates has done is it's hollowed out the foundation to the point it's gonna crack. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've thought uh, probably, I don't know, for the last six or eight months when, when rates got as high as one and a half, one and three quarters, my thought process was at 275 to 3%, that's when you're going to see uh, assets get annihilated price-wise. So we'll see if I'm right. Um, but if you do, if you look back in history, uh, going all the way back to 1982, which was the peak in interest rates when they started coming down, every time uh, 1987, uh, 94, 98, 2000, 2007, 2008, whenever interest rates rise, something in the financial system breaks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're at now. We're right on the cusp of something breaking. Uh, if you want to look at real estate, for example, you could have gotten a 30-year mortgage under 3% a year ago, or even well less than a year ago. Mm -hmm. You could have gotten uh, three, three and an eighth, something like that. Now we're over 5%. And what that does is it creates uh, a lesser ability for buyers because they qualify for less mortgage based on their income. So what, that's, what that does is, if you want to call it a buyer's strike or, or, or what have you, it, it basically creates less demand. Mm -hmm. uh, then you look at stocks. Uh, stocks, you know, the, the, for many years, people were saying, well, look at look at stocks. Uh, the dividend yield is is very close to the treasury yield. So, from a competitive standpoint, now stocks are behind the curve as far as uh, their ability to pay dividends versus versus treasuries. And then look at the real economy. Mm -hmm. Nothing moves without credit. Mm -hmm. And once you start raising the cost of credit, you you begin to uh, lessen the ability to produce, to ship, et cetera. So what you're seeing with these higher interest rates, it to me, it, it looks like something is going to break. Mm -hmm. And that something is more than likely fi uh, financial derivatives. And there's over one quadrillion with a Q 
of financial derivatives outstanding. So just understand that this is a, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a financial orgy where everybody owes everyone else. And once someone in the chain breaks, the entire chain breaks. And it becomes a like a stone hitting a pond. The ripples, the ripples will go throughout the whole pond. As you watch the bought off lamestream fake media's business channels, Fox Business News, CNBS, Reuters, Bloomberg, but Bill, they all push this narrative. Oh, the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates nine times in the coming year. Bill, 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 Bill. They, 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 <laughs> they, 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 just, they just tried it once and it's already wobbling. Bill, there is no way. There is no way. Because you've always pointed this out. And, and might I say, got a lot of grief for this, saying where we are with our debt, we can't service our debt. If they keep jack, right. If, if right, yeah, it's not possible for them to raise uh, Fed funds to two or three percent. That's an impossibility. And when you're talking about servicing the debt, let's just look at at the largest debtor, or yeah, the largest debtor in the world, the U.S. government, mm -hmm. with thirty trillion dollars in debt. Interest rates at three percent. Hmm. means that the Treasury has to pay out $900 billion in interest payments before they open the doors, basically January 1st. And that number for uh, probably 30 years altogether uh, was in the neighborhood of 350 to $450 billion. What happened was the, the Treasury kept borrowing, deficit spending, the debt increased and increased, as interest rates went lower and lower. But rates could really, in, in the reserve currency, and I guess in the real world to be functional, rates cannot go below zero. So we got to zero, but the debt continued to increase. So now we're at the point where that debt service is exploding mm -hmm. and it's gonna lay bare, if you wanna call it the insolvency of the US Treasury. And one other thing, Dave, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, the Bank of Japan, mm -hmm. if you look at the Fed, mm -hmm. and you you look at the assets that they hold mm -hmm. versus their equity, mm -hmm. there probably is no equity left. They are probably in a negative equity situation simply because interest rates have gone up and their holdings have dropped in value. Bill, you mentioned earlier in this interview... Um, about a derivatives meltdown. Huh? Uh, Bill, uh, people have said to me this past couple of weeks, well, you know, Dave, how exactly would a derivatives meltdown manifest itself? And I said, you haven't been paying attention. It, it, just in the past month, there was a derivatives meltdown. Just look at what happened with nickel and the London Metals, right. Medi uh, uh, Metals Exchange. Am I right on that, Bill? Yeah, no, that's exactly correct. Uh, we live with a uh, we, we live with a fractional reserve banking system, mm -hmm. and that fractional reserve banking system, back in the late '80s, early '90s, spilled over to real markets, which have become fractional reserve. And what happened in nickel? There were more contracts sold short than there was nickel available to deliver. Mm -hmm. And you saw nickel within two days rise, what, 200, 250%. Right. And half of that move was negated. It was done on a Monday. And all of those trades at the end of the day were canceled. So it's almost like the like the movie Trading Places. They're saying, uh, turn the markets back on. Rather than doing that, what they did was they shut off what happened. They, they just canceled the trades. So, in essence, they novated the the contracts. They novated the trading. Uh, but that's the way it stands in in many different commodities. That's the way it stands in credit markets. That's the way it stands in equity markets. Derivatives themselves are far larger than the assets that they're derived from in the first place. So it's it is the tail wagging the dog. So, Bill, I believe it was a criminal act what they did by negating these trades. Yes, okay. So then the question right. people ask is, well, wait a minute. 
you know, they kind of cordoned that off by because they own the Little Red Wagon. So they said, oh, we're just going to let... But they said, well, why, why can't they do this in all the different markets? And the answer, I believe, Bill, and tell me if I'm wrong, once it starts to spread in other markets, it becomes overwhelming where they cannot cordon it off by doing that. Am I off on that? No, I, I agree with that 100%. And I do think that it is going to spill over to all the other markets. And as I mentioned, uh, with interest rates going higher, the important thing to understand is with all the derivatives, when they're, and I'm talking about OTC derivatives now, I'm not talking about uh, COMEX or LBMA or what have you, all derivatives have an interest rate assumption when they're first created. Mm -hmm. So when you change the, the, the prevailing interest rates, that contract changes. Mm -hmm. The contract, I shouldn't say the contract changes, the contract remains firm, but the the uh, the value yeah. of the contract changes because there's an underlying interest rate assumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Bill, did you find and this? I do think, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I do think this is gonna spread to all markets, but just understand when it happens in one market, It'll happen in a second and a third and a fourth. And like you said, it's markets are now far too much larger than the ability of central banks to put these fires out. Bill, there are many people outside this window in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor that believe that when we speak about this great reset that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum have all spoken about for several years now, they still accuse us of this being conspiracy theory, that they we're actually making this up. And at the heart of the Great Reset is the fact that the U.S. dollar will no longer be the reserve currency of the world. So, Bill, did you find this at all significant? This happened several weeks ago. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, the Russian finance ministry, 2 o'clock in the morning Eastern time, the Russian finance ministry stepped up and said that they saw gold as an alternative to the U.S. dollar. Twelve hours later, Powell, the head of the Fed, was testifying in front of Congress and stated, quote, it's possible to have more than one reserve currency, end quote. Bill, I believe those two, situ those two, uh, pre uh, those two announcements were in fact linked, and I believe it was their acknowledgement that, yeah, you know what? The reset is not some time off in the distant future. The reset is here and now. Yeah, the, the reset is in the in progress, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote an article uh, immediately after Russia's announcement, and I I termed it the the biggest uh, monetary news since 1973, mm -hmm. and before that was 1971. 71 is when the U.S. Uh, went off the gold standard, mm -hmm. and then 73 is when uh, Kissinger came up with the idea and accepted by the Saudis and other Arab nations that they would only accept dollars for oil. Mm -hmm. And that created the petrodollar and that's what supported the dollar after going off of gold because it created uh, artificial demand for the dollar. And if you just look back over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, there have been others that talked about uh, backing a current currency with gold mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now debt I'm talking about Saddam Hussein Muammar Gaddafi they were going to do a gold dinar and mm -hmm. what happened to them their country mm -hmm. got invaded they were killed and their gold was stolen um, so I, I think that this news that Russia will only accept either rubles mm -hmm. the way they put it was we will only accept rubles or gold, of course. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is they want either their currency right. or gold right. for their goods. The problem is, the problem for the West, the problem for the U.S., is that Russia is such an important or integral piece mm -hmm. of supply of so many different raw materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at oil, you can look at gas, you can look at wheat. Uh, zinc, lithium, I mean, just go, go down the list. They're a, a major, I don't 
I don't think in any of those categories they provide less than 10% of, of the world's supplies. So for them to say we're only going to accept rubles, first off, that those contracts in the past had been in dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be less dollar demand. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a chart of the ruble, you'll see that it went from 80, uh, 80 rubles to the dollar to about 140 immediately after the, the invasion started. And guess where we are now? We're back to 80 and actually under 80. We traded it as the, the ruble traded as high as 71 to the dollar uh, last Thursday or Friday. So their currency has come back 100%. Mm -hmm. And just remember, you had the mainstream media, uh, you, had, you had Biden even calling the ruble rubble. Right. When it first started getting hit. Right, right. Which is the single so greatest indicator. Is now, it's which is the single greatest indicator that the ruble is about to skyrocket in price. When you have Joe Biden, slow Joe, talking about it, the ruble is rubble. Oh, come on, man. Right. I've actually had people ask me, and I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I've had people ask me, how do I buy the ruble? Man, I, I... I mean, it's, it's, it's such a... You know, the ruble was was very obscure. It was an obscure market. Right. Um, and basically, all you could do was, you know, institutions trade. I I I have not been able to find a way for uh, retail or individuals to purchase the ruble. Probably the easiest way to purchase the ruble is to purchase gold. Is buy gold. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. I, yeah, I, yeah. You get a lot of pun intended, I guess, bang for the buck there by doing so. So, uh, Bill, right. um, a former New York Fed official by the name of Zoltan Posner, you, you and I have spoken about him before, but he recently yep. penned an article, and, and in it he said, quote, when the war is over, money will never be seen the same again. Essentially, right. Bill, I think what he was saying is, look, uh, there's going to be a new financial system when all this settles down, and it might be a gold, silver back ruble, gold, silver back yuan, if Putin and Xi have their way. It might be an SDR, a special drawing rights, basket of currencies and commodities, if, if Soros and Schwab have their way. But there's something right. coming down the line where the reserve currency of the world is not the dollar. Is that your interpretation as well as what he was saying? Yeah, exactly. Um, he talks about inside money and outside money. Inside mm -hmm. money are are the currencies that are are printed freely by central banks, and outside money is money that is backed by uh, commodities as collateral. So, I mean, what he's talking about is getting moving closer to real settlement. In other words, when you do a trade, you're giving something real and you're getting something back in exchange that has real backing as opposed to the current uh you know dollar for goods is something for nothing so about a three weeks ago bill people out here in the people's republic of ann arbor yeah a uh, globalist extraordinaire were saying oh <laughs> that biden he got tough he got tough with putin he kicked him out of the swift system and he nailed him on the visa mastercard he shut them up He's got him on bent knee heat. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What he just did is he just forced Russia and China together in an easier mode for them to implement a, this great reset and a different reserve currency. Now, Bill, either I'm right on this or they're right on this, Bill. Where, who's what, was, was Biden Mr. Tough Guy by doing this? Or did he actually hasten the process by, by these particular moves that I'm sure were... were uh, put in his ear, if you will, by his globalist handlers. Right. Yeah, basically, he pulled the pin on the grenade. Yeah. Um, we talked back in, I think it was 2014, when there was a threat against the Swiss to cut them off of the, the SWIFT system if they, if they did not uh, divulge mm -hmm. the names, tax ID numbers, etc., of... Their, their foreign U.S. customers. So that was the first one. Then 
uh, I think it was 2017, 18, they started talking about using Swift as a, as a club, if you will, uh, to, to browbeat people into line. And then, of course, uh, they went ahead, went forward with cutting Russia off of Swift. And what did that do? Basically, they shot themselves in the foot. They blew their, their foot right off mm -hmm. because Russia will still trade. Uh, Russia is trading with China in, uh, in Yuan. Russia is, chi is trading with India mm -hmm. in rubles and rupee. Mm -hmm. All of that trade used to be in dollars. Mm -hmm. Now it's no longer in dollars. So that demand is gone and understand the need for the U.S. to print now is as great as it was uh, back on September, what was it, 17th, 18th of 2019 when the repo market broke. When repo broke, interest mm -hmm. rates went from under 1% to 10% overnight. And, you know, I've said this many times and I've gotten, I've gotten some crap for saying it, but uh, COVID was extremely, uh, it was not coincidental. It was extremely fortunate, if you will. Yes. Because what it did was it slowed down, it lowered the demand. Mm -hmm. for credit and as the demand for credit dropped they were able to, uh, it took the it took the pressure off of interest rates so and, and it also allowed uh, the Fed to create more dollars it allowed the Treasury to borrow more dollars because all these these dollars where did they go this was the first time it went out to the public in form of, uh, you know, COVID relief payments. Uh, what was there, three or four of those? But it was in the, literally in the trillions. So it allowed, it, it gave cover to the Fed to do what they had to do. And that was print more. And the reason they have to print more is because just like any Ponzi scheme, you can never shut off new investors. You always need new investors in a Ponzi scheme to keep the thing afloat. And that's what this whole system is, is a Ponzi scheme. And the central banks, by necessity, have to uh, put new capital into the Ponzi scheme. And that's via money supply and new debt. So, Bill, sorry for this noise behind me here, but Bill, uh, play this out. Play this out over the ensuing couple months of how you think the shoes are going to drop. As I mentioned, I, th I think uh, something is going to break in the 275, 3% range for the 10-year Treasury. If I'm right about that, uh, and even if I'm not right about that, it's going to happen because that, that threshold, as debt increases, that threshold becomes lower and lower. But what I, I really do believe that you are going to see uh, massive defaults and not necessarily starting with a bank, but it's going to end up in the bank's laps because, and I wrote in that article uh, right after the uh, right after the Russian ruble, I wrote in that article that the world has been nickeled. And what I meant by that was the world saw basically a default. It was not only a, a failure if you want to call it a failure to deliver, but what it was, it was the powers that be changing the rules in midstream because they got caught short. So I, I do believe it's going to be a, a some type of derivative is going to blow up and it's going to end up in the bank's laps. And they clearly uh, do not have the capital available uh, to backstop this. Pam and Ross Martins just did an article yesterday um, talking about literally the trillions. Mm. And this was just released a couple days ago or, or yesterday. Uh, the trillions that the Fed lent out to keep the system afloat after the two, 2019 uh, repo crack up. I mean, I think the number was something like $28 trillion cumulatively. And guess who the biggest borrower of that was? J.P. Morgan. 
Boom. And you got Jamie Dimon Boom. running around the world saying, we have a fortress balance sheet. Yeah, well, right. If you had a fortress balance sheet, <laughs> you didn't have to borrow trillions of dollars to keep yourself afloat. So, Bill, um, when it all comes down to it, um, the single most effective way for folks to protect themselves from a, financially in this type of environment is physical gold and physical silver. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's part of it. Uh, you need to get out of the system. Yeah. If you have uh, bank balances, brokerage balances in a money market account, um, you need to get out of the system. If you have stocks with a broker, have those certificated and sent to you. Mm -hmm. That way, if your broker goes under, it's not going to take you three, four, five years while they're going through bankruptcy to get your shares back. Uh, you want to become as self-reliant as you can. And like you said, with gold and silver, getting your capital out of the system, it needs to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And gold and silver are the only monies on the planet that have no liability. They're not issued by a government. They're, there's no promises behind them at all. All they are is proof positive that labor, capital, and equipment has already been used to mine and mint or, or fabricate the metal into bar coin or coin form. So the idea with, with gold and silver is they are, they are cash. They are the safe haven. If you think back, uh, you know, I go back 40, 50, even 100 years, the best thing to do if you saw a bear market coming was liquidate mm -hmm. and put your money into, into cash. And, of course, 100 years ago, uh, cash was still gold. That was your safe haven. That was your, your port in the storm. And, I mean, even, uh, even 50 years ago, or a little more than 50 years ago, uh, the dollar could be seen as a safe haven because theoretically it was backed by gold. So you, you want to get out of the system and you want to get as defensive as possible. And basically I'm, I'm speaking financially now, but for your real world uh, living experience, if you will, you want to become as self-sufficient as you can. If there's a way that you can produce your own electricity and, and be off the grid, absolutely. You absolutely need a way uh, to get water. I mean, if you're on a city of water system, is that going to stay up? Is it going to stay clean? I don't know. I suspect not. But if you have the ability to drill a well and, and filtrate, absolutely, um, store up food. You know, all these things we're talking about now, were in the past, oh, that's just total conspiracy theory. Well, even Joe Biden is telling you that there's going to be food shortages. And food shortages should mean higher prices. But in many cases, it's going to mean non-existent. And think about this, Dave. Uh, use Brazil for an example. This uh, Brazil is not able to get... Uh, fertilizer out of Russia. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the case. The, the, the supply chain of the basic ingredients to growing, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, what have you, the basic ingredients have become much more expensive if, if you can get them. Mm -hmm. So this, this year's, this forthcoming crop, I believe is going to be a disaster. I think that's something that Joe Biden said that you can believe. Uh, Bill, you've been doing this for decades. Um, let's let's uh, conclude our interview. Where do you see the supply issues as it relates to gold and silver at this point? You, you've you've seen a lot over the decades. Where are we in this big spectrum? Uh, there still seems to be ample supply in gold. I can tell you the supply in silver is ridiculously thin. Mm. Uh, and I'll, really, all you have to do is look at premiums. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Eagles are now $14 over spot. Mm -hmm. That's over a 50% premium based on $25, $26 silver. Uh, the canary in the gold mine has always been the junk silver market. Junk silver are the pre-1964 or pre-1965 dimes, quarters, and a half dollars. Right now, 
I'll bet you there's not a hundred bags across the U.S. that are for sale. Really? I mean, in the first three months, and, and I have concentrated with clients since, <clears throat> I want to say 2016 or 17, my thought process is, is junk silver for an American is the best form. And the reason being, it can't be counterfeited because it has to look scruffy. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what a diamond dime or quarter looks like. You drop it on a table, it sounds different than current coins. And a dollar thirty-eight equals one ounce. So that's thirteen point eight dimes. So call that fourteen you get fourteen transactions in a system down scenario with dimes versus a one ounce eagle or a bar or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can remember uh, six, seven years ago selling junk silver at spot mm. or 50 cents over spot. It's now basically 850 over spot, and that's if you can get it. So that's the canary in the coal mine, and I can tell you uh, for a fact that getting, uh, getting silver from the Australian men, the Austrian men, uh, the Canadian men, the the uh, uh, the British men, those are becoming. What's happening is you're having to pay today, and you're not going to get product for another 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're really backed up. And I've always said because silver is such a small market. I mean, it's if you, even at today's prices, you're only looking at 20 billion dollars total of produced silver each year because it's such a small market that silver would blow up mm -hmm. and it would then ignite gold and then it's all over because the the game is up i mean the the game between dollar good gold bad you know people are going to understand that the dollar has been crushed and actually dave let me go back to what i had spoken about uh, on deflation yes we're going to, I believe we will see a deflation of uh, real estate, a deflation of stocks. We're already seeing a deflation in uh, credit markets in terms of dollars. But if you look at, uh, look at Venezuela or look at Zimbabwe or look at any of the countries that have gone through a hyperinflation, at the beginning of the hyperinflation, you'll see there's, you'll see the stock market drop on average, say, 30 to 50 percent and then they, they skyrocket they go to the moon the thing is they don't go up as fast as the currency goes down so that's one way to measure it that's in nominal terms but in real terms measured against gold what happened in 1929 where the stock market went down 89 percent and remember that was measured against gold because dollars were gold that was an 89% drop. I don't think that's possible in nominal terms because the dollar is going to hyperinflate and you may see a uh, million dollar Dow, but that's in dollars and it will the Dow will actually be much, much lower in terms of gold. So the, the, the real de, the, the deflation that's coming mm -hmm is not so much nominal deflation because they can inflate the currency, but it will be real deflation versus the price of gold and silver. Bill, educate our listeners on how they can follow you on a daily basis and how they can contact you as it relates to your being a broker with precious in precious metals. Sure. Uh, you can go to uh, www.jsmineset.com. Uh, that's where we post our our writings. We do a weekly uh, we do a weekly interview for subscribers, and we post articles. We probably post two or three articles a day, and just put a one or two line comment if when we post what we think is relevant and what's important. Um, we also, by the way, Dave, I don't know if you knew this or not, but we we're offering a compendium, which goes back to 2008. So. Every single thing that's been posted on JS Mindset since 2008, up until I think October, November this past year, is on one uh, USB stick. And that, that comp that's comprised of over 11,000 posts. And 
our hope is that it's it emerges in 20 years or 50 or even 100 years as a time capsule. And the reason I'm saying time capsule is we still to this day ask how could the Germans in the 1930s have been so stupid <laughs> to allow what happened? And with with the fake news and basically all the bullshit that's being fed to the populace, mm -hmm. this is real time commentary and and the truth as it was happening, because you know we we obviously uh, questioned mainstream media, we we que questioned official dumb, if you will, all along the way, and pretty much told the story. So our hope is that that people uh, purchase these compendiums, put them away, and maybe their great grandchild mm -hmm. will pull it out, look at it, and say, hey, wait a minute, 